Welcome to Trench Diaries. This is Battleship Bismarck Part 15. Bismarck's gunfire, to which Schmalenbach refers, was being directed at our persistent shadower, the Suffolk. We met her in the course of our turn and opened fire at a range of 18,000 meters. She immediately turned away and laid down smoke, but the Prince of Wales, which was farther away from us, opened up with her 356 mm guns. We turned to our originally planned southerly course and continued the gunnery duel with the Prince of Wales. But the extreme range at which we thought, 28,000 meters, coupled with the glare of the sun on the surface of the water and the clouds of stack smoke, made observation from the main fire control center in the foretop so difficult that Schneider was able to fire only single salvos at long intervals. Since the enemy was astern of us, he eventually ordered me to take over the fire control. Apparently he thought that I, in my station aft, could see better. Such was not the case. The range was too great for me to make reliable observations either. I told Schneider this and after a few salvos had been fired at my direction, we got the order to cease fire. Neither side scored a hit in this sporadic exchange of salvos. At 1914 Lütjens, still under a misapprehension about the identity of the British battleship, reported to High Command, short action with King George V without result. Prince Eugen released to fuel. Enemy maintains contact. Since leaving Prince Eugen, the fact that we were alone gradually sank into our consciousness and there was mounting tension as we wondered what surprise the coming hours and days might bring us. That was something we did not have to wonder about for long. If for no other reason than to make up for the shame of losing Hood, the British would do everything they possibly could to bring an overwhelming concentration of powerful ships to bear on us. How many and which would they be? Where were they at the moment and in what combination? These uncertainties created tension and were the most important objects of our speculation. A great deal, if not everything, would depend on our shaking off our shadows and getting as far as possible along the projected great curve towards western France without being observed. Our fuel supply being tight because of the 1000 tons cut off in the fossil, we reduced speed to an economical 21 knots. With a little luck, we would reach Saint-Nazaire without having to fight. Shortly before 1900, Lutyens received Group West's answer to the radio signal he had sent earlier that morning, saying that he intended to take Bismarck to Zonazer and to release Prince Eugen to conduct cruiser warfare. Group West concurred and had already made arrangements for Bismarck to be received at Zonazer and also at Brest. The auxiliary arrangements at Brest had been made in case it became impossible for any reason for Bismarck to go into Zonazer. Group West made the suggestions that, in the event enemy contact had been shaken off, Bismarck make a long detour en route to port, obviously hoping that this would wear out the British pursuers. It wasn't a bad idea, and it is more than likely that Lutyens had considered doing just that. What Group West did not know was that Bismarck's fuel situation had been changed by the damage she had suffered. A fact that had not been reported. Therefore, it must have been surprised to receive Lutyens' radio signal at 2056. Shaking of contact impossible due to enemy radar, due to fuel steering direct for Saint-Nazaire. Why Lutyens considered our fuel situation so much more serious on the evening of May the 24th than he had at midday, I do not know. Perhaps he had finally accepted the fact that there was no way we could draw on the fuel oil stored in the fossil. The fleet commander's decision to make direct for Saint-Nazaire had immediate and important results. U-Boat High Command, supposing his instructions to form a line of U-Boats south of Greenland to be thereby cancelled, adjusted his dispositions to the Bismarck's new course towards France. Appropriate instructions were sent to U-93, U-43, U-46, U-557, U-66 and U-94. U-556 was ordered to act as a scout. Since the fruitless actions with Prince of Wales, which took place a little over 1900 on May the 24th, Bismarck had held steady on her southerly course. Before long, a report came over the ship's loudspeakers that there was probably an aircraft carrier in the area. All our anti-aircraft gun crews immediately went on full alert. Then, around 23.30, it was still light as day, several pairs of aircraft were seen approaching on the port bow. They were beneath a layer of clouds and we could see them clearly, getting into formation to attack us. Naturally, we did not know it then, but they were from the Victorious, the carrier that accompanied Torvi's force out to Scapa Flow on the evening of May the 22nd. 
Tavi's objective was to intercept the German task force southwest of Iceland, in the unlikely event that, after Admiral Holland's attack with Hood and Prince of Wales, interception would still be necessary. It was, as it turned out. Aircraft alarm. In seconds, every anti-aircraft gun on Bismarck was ready for action. One after the other, the planes came toward us, nine swordfish in total, torpedoes under their fuselages. Daringly, they flew through our fire, nearer to the fire-spitting mountain of the Bismarck, always nearer and still nearer. Watching through my director, which, having been designed for surface targets, had a high degree of magnification but only a narrow field of view, I could not see all the action. I could see only parts of it, and that only so far as the swirling smoke of our guns allowed. But what I could see was exciting enough. Our anti-aircraft batteries fired anything that would fit into their barrels. Now and again, one of our 38cm turrets and frequently our 15cm turrets fired into the water ahead of the aircraft, raising massive water spouts. To fly into one of those spouts would mean the end. And the aircraft. They were moving so slowly that they seemed to be standing still in the air and they looked so antiquated. Incredible how the pilots pressed their attack with suicidal courage, as if they did not expect ever again to see a carrier. In the meantime, we had increased speed to 27 knots and begun to zigzag sharply to avoid the torpedoes that were splashing into the water. This was an almost impossible task because of the close range and the low altitude from which the torpedoes were launched. Nevertheless, the captain and the quartermaster, Matrosenhauptgefreiter Hans Hansen, who was steering from the open bridge, did a brilliant job. Some of the planes were only two meters above the water and did not release their torpedoes until they had closed to 400 or 500 meters. It looked to me as though many of them intended to fly on over us after making their attack. This was the height of impudence, I thought. The enemy's tactics were such that torpedoes were coming at us from several directions at the same time and, in trying to avoid one, we were liable to run into another. Back and forth we zigzagged. All at once the sharp, ringing report of an explosion punctuated the roar of our guns and Bismarck gave a slight shudder. At the moment I was only aware that whatever had caused it must have taken place forward of my duty station. Although I silently cursed what I supposed was a torpedo hit, my immediate reaction was that it had not done much harm. Undoubtedly, launched at close range, it could not possibly have reached its set depth. It would have been dangerous to us if it had, but it had probably struck in the area where our armor belt was strongest, at the waterline amidships. That armor, I was sure, would not be bothered by a little aerial torpedo. Nonetheless, I took a careful look at the speed and rudder position indicators they showed that the engines and rudder were intact. Thank God. What had happened? A torpedo, perhaps the last one launched and a surface runner at that, had struck the armor belt amidships on the starboard side and exploded, creating a tall water spout. It was delivered by a pilot who left his wingman and came in, unnoticed by us, in the glare of the setting sun. The concussion of the hit hurled Oberbootsmann Kurt Kirchberg, who was handling ammunition in the immediate vicinity of the explosion, against something hard. He was killed instantly. The first man to die on board Bismarck. We sewed up his corpse in sailcloth and laid it in a boat. His death made a deep impression on all his shipmates in that he was the only fatality, but it was especially distressing to those who had come to know him as a strict but capable and understanding superior. Below, the explosion made it seem as though the ship had been thrust sideways with much greater force than had been the case when the shells hit that morning and then was created by the recoil of our own guns. In the command and damage control center the lights went out for a minute or two and everyone thought, it's all over now. Then the ship returned to her normal trim, the damage control parties inspected their areas and their telephone reports buzzed into damage control center. The men there were still a little pale but otherwise calm. Look here, Pumpenmeister Sangner called to them encouragingly. Only the dear God himself can sink our ship. Only the young runner in the command center had lost a little of his nerve. He put on his life jacket and wanted to inflate it, fidgeting around all this under the eye of the first officer. The latter gave him a terrific dressing down, but the seaman had to wind up so badly that he could not take in any of it. Comrades brought him to the nearby compartment used as a holding station where he could calm down. In the record time of three minutes the ship's command knew the situation in every sector. Hardly any material damage had been done, although artillery Obermechaniker Heinrich Juhl and five other men had broken bones. 
In Action Station E in Compartment 9 on the lower platform deck, the shock threw machine gefreiter Budich crossways across the compartment to the main instrument panel. Stupefied silence reigned. Obermachinist Baho broke it by asking, But Budich, where are you going in such a hurry? The release of laughter and entering reports quickly dissolved the momentary tension. Shortly before the attack began, Matrosengefreiter Georg Herzog of the port 3rd 3.7 cm mount spotted three planes to port and rang out, three aircraft approaching at 240 degrees. I had the feeling, he said later, that the British were putting their all into this attack and were coming in with exceptional daring to deliver their torpedoes. It seemed to me that they came within 15 meters of the ship before they turned away. Matrosengefreiter Herbert Mantai of the starboard 5th 2cm mount noticed that, at first, the incoming planes tried to make a concentrated attack on our port side. Then they separated to attack from different directions. When he asked Oberleutnant Sose Siegfried Dölker, his section commander, about this, he was told that three squadrons of torpedo planes had participated in the attack. Our constant zigzagging to avoid torpedoes had greatly complicated his efforts to bring his guns to bear. And towards the end of the attacks, he heard the explosion to starboard. Morale in the ship after the attack, whose end was easily told by the cessation of anti-aircraft fire, was outstanding. The crew felt even better when they heard that five enemy aircraft had been shot down. In fact, none had been. Although we weathered it quite well, it cannot be said that we came out of the swordfish attack unscathed. When we increased speed to 27 knots, water pressure increased correspondingly and that, together with our violent zigzags, caused the matting in the fossil to rip and water began rushing in again. The result was that we were still more deeply down by the bow. Furthermore, vibration from our gunfire and the shock response of the starboard torpedo hit enlarged the gash in the bulkhead between port boiler room number 2 and the adjacent electric power station, which had flooded after the shell hit that morning to such an extent that the boiler room also flooded and had to be given up. We reduced speed and steamed at 16 knots long enough for the matting in the fossil to be made watertight again. Meanwhile, we resumed course towards Saunazer. Sometime after midnight, Lutyens reported home. He said, Attack by torpedo planes. Torpedo hit on starboard. And around 0200, torpedo hit, not important. Soon after the air attack, we became engaged in a brief sea fight again with the Prince of Wales, which had reappeared on the horizon. She fired two salvos from around 15,000 meters. Schneider answered two or three times with our big guns, but fading light made observation difficult for both sides. The British battleship steamed out of sight and the intermezzo was over. The air attack on Bismarck was the last of the measures that Tovi had planned before leaving Scapa Flow on the evening of May the 22nd. Despite the impressive performance of the Suffolk and Norfolk in maintaining contact, the German task force had not been destroyed nor had its speed been so drastically reduced that it would be possible, without doing anything else, to bring other big ships up against it. Nor were there any such ships near enough to be brought up right away. For Tavi and the Admiralty, the failure as such was bad enough, but the loss of Hood made it doubly hard to bear. Hood was not just any battlecruiser. To the Royal Navy, and indeed to the nation, she was the incarnation of British sea power. Wake Walker had succeeded Holland as senior naval officer on the scene, and his laconic report, Hood was blown up, hit London like a ball of lightning. If it had been necessary to sink the Bismarck before, the loss of Hood made it even more so. On the evening of May the 23rd, Tavi with the home fleet, consisting of the King George V, the Victorious, the Repulse, several cruisers and some destroyers, was about 550 nautical miles southeast of the German task force. He had chosen a course to the northwest so that he would be in a position to intercept the German ships whether, after the expected action with Holland's force, they went back through the Denmark Strait or, although heavily damaged, continued to make for the Atlantic. Now. Everything was different and Tavi had little hope of being able to engage the German task force as long as it continued to the southwest at high speed. So, the first wave of aerial attacks is over and Bismarck has already sustained a torpedo hit. And even though the torpedo bulge took the brunt and only one seaman died, it already shows how factually obsolete aircraft can take down even modern, for the time, battleships. The swordfish at this point was pretty much outdated and yet, you all know the rest. 
In fact, the Swordfish was the most successful plane in the European theater and sank the most tonnage of Axis shipping during the whole war. Truly remarkable. I mean, just look at how slow it is. The reasons why Bismarck wasn't able to shoot down even one plane will be discussed later, but safe to say, it's more than one singular reason. On another note, the author mentions U-557 as being part of the submarine escort slash support that was underway, and as you may know, U-557 was prominently featured in another video series on this channel, Iron Coffins that is, whose author served for some time on this very same U-boat. Another sub, U-556, actually had a special bond with the big ship, and I will put the, quote, official certificate of sponsorship on screen. If you want to know more about this, I will link a video of Iron Coffins below, where this is discussed in detail. Until next time, when the British intensify their air attacks. I will see you then. Remember to like, comment, subscribe. I read every single comment. I appreciate your support. Cheers, bye bye.